Und diese Extremisten. Kriegstreiber. Verbrecher. Das ist ein Diktator. Der Schurken auch. Feinde der Menschenrechte. I have uh, these three American speakers, and I would call them public diplomats, who just came back from Donbass area. Uh, certainly, they have a lot of to tell you what they have seen, you know, and even to show. So they will have uh, short uh, statements, and after that, they will be happy to answer your questions. And let me introduce the speakers. So the first one is uh, Daniel Kavalik. He is lawyer human rights scholar, peace activist. Uh, Christopher Hilali, a member of the Administrative Committee, United National Anti-War Coalition, International Secretary of the Communist Party. And uh, Jackson Hinkle, political commentator, journalist. So, uh, then you have the floor. Right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk about my recent trip to Lugansk, which I just came back from. However, I, I want to note that in the last year and a half, I've been to Russia five times. On one trip, I went to Crimea. I've been to Donetsk twice and to Kherson. So um, I think I have a good handle on, on what's happening in some of those, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, contested uh, areas. Uh, but as I said, I, we just got back from Lugansk, and I think it's important to note that we were hosted both with inside Russia, mainland Russia and Lugansk, by the Union of Political Emigrants and Political Prisoners of Ukraine. That is to say, we were not hosted by the Russian government. We weren't even hus hosted by Russian citizens. We were hosted the entire time by people uh, who were born in Ukraine, some who emigrated to uh, to Russia, some who have stayed uh, within at least what was uh, Ukraine before the SMO. Um, our main individual who who showed us around in um, Lugansk is a guy named Alexei. He's from Odessa, and he was at the Odessa Trade Union building when I'm sure all of you know on May second, two thousand fourteen. Uh, rightists that were loyal to Kiev burned the building down with people inside it, murdering 48 individuals. If you don't know about that, then I don't know what to say. Uh, that event helped spur on the people of Lugansk and Donetsk to seek independence from Ukraine because it was targeted against Russian-speaking people. Um, and they... Uh, were worried that more violence was to come, and uh, they declared independence after referenda. Um, and this is important to note, by the way. You know, uh, some experts have properly said that uh, their right to independence uh, is actually even greater than that of Kosovo's, which never did have a referendum. Um, but of course, the West recognizes Kosovo as an independent uh, republic, but does not recognize. Donetsk and Lugansk for political reasons, not for any other reason. By the way, Alexei said, uh, you know, he quoted, uh, and I'm forgetting the guy's name, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, I believe he was a Protestant minister who said back during World War II in Germany, he said first they came for the communists, then they came for the trade unionists, then they came for the Christians. And Alexei said that's exactly what happened in Ukraine after 2014. They came for the communists, they came for the trade unionists, of course, again, burning down the trade union hall in Odessa, and then they came for the Christians, right? Destroying Orthodox churches, um, for example, that continue to be loyal to the patriarch in Russia. Again, something not covered very well in the press. None of this is, of course. Um, the press has utterly become a, uh, a mouthpiece for the State Department on, on this. I, in fact, I would say, and I would chastise the press, if I may. I think this is the worst covered conflict I've ever seen in my lifetime. It's frankly a joke, and it's just shame how this has been covered. Um, we visited a mass grave uh, in Lugansk known as the Open Wound. 
I say a mass grave. I mean, they're, they're, the people are properly buried, but they're buried en masse, and many with un, uh, uh, un, many are of the people buried are unidentified. Uh, these are people that have been exhumed, people killed by the Ukrainian government uh, since 2014. Now, finally, probably uh, given a proper burial in this um, area, which is also a, a monument to the dead, to the victims of, of Ukraine. Um, Sergei Belov accompanied us on this day to that monument. He himself was part of a group that helped exhume over 1,000 bodies of such victims over the years. Of course, it needs to be reiterated because, again, I think the press has forgotten this uh, willfully, that 14,000 people died in the war between Kiev and the Donbass between 2014 and the start of Russia's military operations in February of 2022. That is, before Russia began those operations, 14,000 people were already dead in that conflict. And that's a 14,000 people, frankly, that have been largely forgotten. Uh, because their existence and their deaths is inconvenient to the narrative of the West on this issue. Uh, I was happy to meet there. We met with Faina Safankova. She's a young poet and journalist. She's age 15. She's from Lugansk. She still lives in Lugansk. Um, she's interviewed me a couple times uh, before we met her, so it was nice to meet her. She's been writing since the age of 11 and, of course, has been on the Ukrainian kill list since the age of 12 a great threat to the government in Kiev. She remembers as a young girl the siege of Donbass by Ukraine in 2014 in which water and electricity were cut off for two months. She remembers living in her cellar to hide from the shelling by Kiev in 2014 to 2015. You may remember that, in fact, President Poroshenko vowed that while his children in the West would go to schools the children in uh, the Donbass would spend the rest of their lives in cellars, as she did. Very nice. Her message, I asked her point blank, I said, if you could say anything to Americans, what would you say? She said that this conflict did not start in 2022. It started in 2014. And another inconvenient fact, and she speaks for many people, she welcomed the SMO. She met, welcomed Russia, Russia's intervention in 2022, wish it had started sooner to protect the people, those 14,000 people who were killed up to that point. Uh, we met with Anna Riano, chief of the organizational department of the 150,000 member Trade Union Federation of Lugansk a union founded after Lugansk became independent in 2014 because it was not very safe to do so before independence. She also said she welcomed Russia's special military operations for the same reason because, well, actually because she specifically said it was necessary to prevent an imminent invasion which Ukraine was preparing in which at least some say it was two or three days away by the time the SMO began. And I actually have a couple of nice props for you. I would refer you to this book by a guy named Jacques Baud. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's from Switzerland. He was a Swiss intelligence officer from the West. And he verifies that that is true, that Ukraine was mounting forces on the border of the Donbass before the special military operations began preparing for an invasion. And by the way, this is also backed up by the Organization of European Security and Cooperation, which recorded over 2,000 ceasefire fire violations between Kiev and the Donbass in the weekend before Russia invaded in February of 2022. This was a massive increase in ceasefire violations. Of course, the OESC, has, I believe, what, 57 members, and many from the West. The U.S. is on it. And up till recently, at least, it was headed by a German. So it's hardly a pro-Russian um, organization who said that. Um, what I, I will say, uh, I want also just a couple brief um, observations, then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, I was impressed by a few things in Lugansk. First of all, we did not go to the front lines. 
We were in the cities, and the cities felt fairly calm and normal. A lot of construction is happening there that, frankly, Russia is doing. We, the main road into the city of Lugansk is built by Russia, brand new road. Uh, and, and every time a building gets shelled, and they continue to be shelled by Kiev, by the way, that's your tax dollars at work. Kiev is shelling civilian buildings, people in Lugansk to this day. We saw some of those buildings. But frankly, as soon as they're shelled, the Russians go in and help start rebuilding, right? And so we saw buildings that were recently shelled, but they had brand new windows that had been put up. So, um, I, I'd like to compare that to how Israel's going to treat the people of Gaza after they've de destroyed 75% of their infrastructure. Um, I am certain, I, I will just say, I'm morally certain after visiting Donetsk and Kherson and Crimea, and Crimea uh, that the people of those regions will never want to be part of Ukraine again, and frankly should not be, that Ukraine, frankly, gave up its right to those areas when they started murdering their own people there. And in regards to Crimea in particular, which a, a Ukrainian official recently described the people who live there and have lived there for centuries as occupiers, by the way, in a very genocidal language, um, I, I refer you to a March 18th, 2020 Washington Post article entitled Six Years and $20 Billion in Russian Investment Later, Crimeans Are Happy with Russian Annexation. And that is true. I can guarantee that people of Crimea want to be part of Russia. I know the West doesn't care what they want and is happy to supply arms that murder beachgoers, including children, as happened recently. Can you imagine if... Cuba used uh, Russian weapons to murder beachgoers in Miami. Um, but the people there, the people of the Donbass, they'll never go back to Ukraine, not willingly. And that's Kiev's fault. And it's the U.S.'s fault for backing a right-wing regime in Kiev that has Nazi elements in it. Again, a very uh, inconvenient fact. I'll just say, as we move closer and closer to a direct confrontation with Russia, towards nuclear annihilation, which so few seem to care about. This historical reality and the experiences and desires of the people in these regions must be taken into account and respected. And I'll say again, the failure of the U.S. press to properly acknowledge and report on these realities has been nothing less than shameful. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Chris, you have the floor. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for this opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, uh, my colleague here, Dan Kovalik, uh, and I recently returned uh, from a fact-finding mission to the Lugansk People's Republic, hosted, as Dan uh, rightfully pointed out, by the Union of Political Emigrants and Political Prisoners of Ukraine. After months of arduous planning and organizing, we felt this delegation was essential for us to see the situation on the ground for ourselves, including interviewing locals and officials who have been party to this conflict since it started in 2014. That is a critical point. This war did not begin in 2022 with Russia's special military operation. Rather, it began in 2014. And I want to emphasize this point. The people of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics in the Donbass have endured a decade of bombardment, terrorism, and brutality, all of which have been severely underreported or even misreported in the West. We visited mass graves, containing hundreds of dead civilians, some of whom remain unidentified to this day. There are a small fraction of the tens of thousands of civilians killed or injured during this siege on the Donbass. We saw shelled civilian infrastructure and other physical instances of war crimes committed by the Ukrainian military. What we discovered provided a completely different understanding that went beyond the myopic narratives proffered by the mainstream media here in the United States and in the West. On our delegation, we were joined by two Georgians, a journalist and an activist. The similarity between Georgia and Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Western involvement in NATO expansion is striking. Georgians fear that the next front for the United States and NATO will be in the Caucasus, as it was in 2007-2008. First and foremost, the narrative that Russia quote-unquote invaded the Donbass in 2014 is completely false, and we saw that on the ground. It not only strips the local population of their agency, but it further promotes an understanding of a population which is occupied against their will. The reality is that the people of the Donbass were citizens of Ukraine in 2014. Many still are. 
Some served in the Ukrainian government, in its military, and its police forces. However, the Maidan uprising in 2014 and the removal of President Viktor Yanukovych sent shockwaves throughout the country. The rise of extremist groups, including prominent neo-Nazi militias and forces, as well as the rampant historical revisionism and denial of the Russian language and identity were critical components of the eventual internal civil strife that quickly morphed into what can aptly be described as a civil war. As human rights ombudsman and former deputy foreign minister of the Lugansk People's Republic, Anna Soroka, put it to me, I was a Ukrainian officer. We were told to love our motherland and to be patriotic. I feel personally betrayed. It was Ukrainian police that provided security in the regions that voted in the referendums for independence. It was Ukrainian police and military personnel who felt that the new government in Kiev was not in the best interest of their people and decided to provide protection and support to their people in the Donbass. This, this simply, they simply changed their uniforms, but they remained Ukrainian. Thus, it was Ukrainians who were struggling with one another over their past, their present, and their future. We witnessed firsthand the crumbling infrastructure, closed factories, unpaved roads, and dilapidated tenements. Here, it is critical to note that we heard from people throughout the Lugansk region that from 1991 to 2014, there was very little investment in eastern Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine was left destitute with no program of reconstruction, rehabilitation, investment, and development. On the contrary, the bulk of the money was concentrated in Kiev and western Ukraine. This led to eastern Ukraine being considered by many as a backwards, uneducated, and primitive territory with homeless, drunk, dirty, and antisocial people, as it was put to me by locals. This division between western and eastern Ukraine has historical legacies that are important to analyze and to understand. The demographic crisis in post-Soviet Ukraine reveals a deeper terminal crisis as millions left in search of better lives. However, since 2022 and the region's incorporation into the Russian Federation, there has been a tremendous amount of investment and improvements in infrastructure in the Donbass. We witnessed the paving of new roads throughout the region, as well as the construction of new apartment buildings, university housing, playgrounds, schools, as well as the rehabilitation of older facilities and factories. As one local resident put it, when, Na when Russia intervenes, it leaves roads, libraries, and schools. When NATO invades the country, all it leaves is rubble. We had the opportunity to visit the Alchevsk Iron and Steel Works plant, a metallurgical complex that dates back to the 19th century. During the Soviet Union, the factory employed upwards of 60,000 people, one of the largest plants of its kind in Europe. Under the Ukrainian government, the factory was privatized, outsourcing its management and operations. By 2010, the plant had only 7,000 workers. This economic upheaval, we were told by local residents, led to the murder of two directors of the plant as a result of the privatization efforts and the resistance to them by the local population. Since 2014, the plant has expanded its work and now employs around 14,000 workers. The siege on the region by Ukrainian forces led to the plant being shelled, as well as the neighboring technical university, which saw its dormitories attacked with precision munitions. We saw the scars on the buildings from missiles, mortars, artillery, and drone attacks, which were being rehabilitated and repaired by local authorities. The Donbass is a land of many wounds. Near historic landmarks from the Great Patriotic War, where thousands of Jews, communists, Soviet civilians of Russian ethnic origin and other undesirables, quote unquote, were massacred, locals recounted the brutal massacre of children during the Great Patriotic War. Plucked from the arms of their mothers, these children were executed by Nazis and their Ukrainian nationalist collaborators who put cyanide under the noses of children because bullets were too precious to be wasted on children. It was near this site where a nursing home for the elderly was commandeered in the early days of the war in 2014 by Ukrainian forces who used the elderly as human shields. In the coming days, an accident led to a catastrophic fire that killed many of the elderly nursing home residents, many of whom could not ambulate and thus were burned alive on the second floor. We were told of Ukrainian paramilitary forces, many of them ultranationalist and neo-Nazi, who in one instance beat an old man with the butts of their rifles and then shot him to death in front of his neighbors. In our discussions with locals and officials, we were made aware of the plethora of war crimes committed by Kiev-backed forces since 2014. In the summer of 2014, Lugansk was under a full military, social, economic, and humanitarian blockade. Ukraine used water as a weapon of war, cutting off water supplies to numerous villages in Lugansk. Children were forced to travel via foot or public transit through active fire zones up to 20 to 30 kilometers to attend school. 
We visit the site of a days-old attack on a residential building by a precision U.S.-supplied HIMARS missile that killed four civilians in the city of Lugansk. The foul smell of the sulfur from the rocket's propellant was still prominent on the site. We visited other sites of destruction throughout the city and region. One apartment complex that had been targeted with U.S.-supplied munitions led to the shattering of over 1,600 windows. All around us, on every face of the buildings, we could see no windows, plastic sheets, or some new windows being installed. This is terrorism. Locals recounted the case of the Stanitska Luhanska Bridge, which was destroyed by Ukrainian forces in 2015. The bridge, a critical piece of infrastructure in the region and the sole crossing point, had collapsed down into the riverbank. A Ukrainian car, we were told, had also come onto the ruined bridge and exploded, leading to further destruction of the bridge. People were forced to navigate the extremely dangerous and treacherous rubble to cross back and forth to see family or for other needs. Pensioners were forced to go back and forth to the Ukrainian side to receive their state pensions. However, they could only do so with a bank card and needed to present themselves personally to the bank to collect their pensions. For elderly pensioners, this was a gross violation of their rights, especially for those who were not ambulatory. Thus, people were forced to climb this broken bridge for over four years. Traffic was usually around 12,000 people per day. The government in Kiev refused a temporary bridge proposed by the International Committee of the Red Cross, and later Germany sent millions of euros for the bridge's reconstruction, which was done in a poor and haphazard way. We had the opportunity for extensive talks with Vladislav Nikolaevich Denego, former foreign minister of the Lugansk People's Republic. Minister Denego provided us with extensive insider knowledge of the diplomatic and peace negotiations from 2014 through 2022. He even allowed us to look at original signed protocol agreements that were part of the Minsk Accords. In our discussions, it became abundantly clear that the chaotic situation within the Ukrainian government post-2014 led to the further erosion of trust and cooperation between the people of the Donbass and the Kiev regime. Many agreements that were reached were not enacted, enforced, or positions were changed overnight. We were told of the United Nations involvement in the Lugansk People's Republic, which requested UN support by then Secretary uh, General Ban Ki-moon, who dispatched Stephen O'Brien, the United Nations Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordination, to help with the situation in Lugansk. O'Brien came to Lugansk and helped with the repairs to civilian infrastructure and equipment. While a, le while a letter of thanks was received from Stephen O'Brien uh, by the Lugansk authorities, there was no recognition of the referendum of independence overwhelmingly passed by the people in Lugansk. In fact, the United Nations itself continued to refer to the Lugansk People's Republic as terrorists until 2016, when the use of terrorists ceased. It is clear for everyone to see that the people of Lugansk are not terrorists. The people of the Donbass have been at war for 10 years. 10 years of trauma, an entire generation has lived through this war. Yet the resilience and tenacity of the people is remarkable. Under these dire conditions, life continues and people seek to enjoy their lives. Yet the danger of an all-out war between the United States and its NATO allies and Russia remains. Many locals we met were resentful of Russia for not recognizing the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics for eight years, leaving them in a permanent state of limbo. The slogans of Russia, Russia, Russia in 2014 were chanted with the aim of being, not with the aim of being part of Russia at the time, but calling to be protected by Russia to protect the civilians from a Western-backed regime that was outlawing their culture and traditions inherited from the USSR and trying to change them by imposing historical revisionism and foreign cultural values. This war is one of survival for the people of the Donbass, not of separatism, expansion, or Russian quote-unquote imperialism. Since early 2014, the people of the Donbass have called on the Ukrainian government to agree to protect, as one local put it, our rights, our language, our history, and our heroes. Our friend, Alexei Albu, a Ukrainian activist from Odessa, who was severely injured in the trade union building massacre in Odessa in 2014, revealed many crimes committed against friends, family, and comrades by the Ukrainian regime and the various fascist forces and militias. He showed one video, video where Ukrainian armored personnel carriers were running over unarmed people in the streets. These crimes must be answered for. They must take uh, into account uh, this evidence that we have amassed. The people of the Donbass knew a war was coming in 2014. Locals recounted their fear of a war that would split the society. People were disoriented as they recounted. One thing they are not is separatists. They never indicated such a thing. The people of the Donbass want to live in peace and to have their rights respected. 
When I asked them if they ever wanted to be part of Ukraine again, every single person I spoke to emphatically said no. It is clear that the people of Lugansk have spoken. Any further peace agreement must begin from that point. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. And now last but not the least, uh, Jackson, please, you, you have the floor. Greetings, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today. I want to share my experiences from my recent trip to the newly liberated territories of the Russian Federation in the Donbass. My journey took me to Mariupol, Takmak, Berdyansk, Melitopol, and the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant over my seven-day trip, providing me with firsthand insights that starkly contradicts the lies and the narratives that have been propagated by the mainstream media and the Western political elite here. Uh, the following three points that I have laid out here are based on my observations, and they reveal a very different reality to what is promoted here in the West. Uh, number one, Ukraine is not seeking an end to this conflict, but is instead trying to escalate it in an unthinkably dangerous manner. Number two, the people of the Donbass do not want to remain under Ukrainian control, but instead hold a great admiration for the Russian Federation and for President Putin. Number three, Ukraine is not defeating Russia, but is instead using its Western support to carry out horrifying acts of terrorism against the people of the Donbass that they claim they want to save. So first, let's talk about Mariupol, the first place I went. During the hour-long drive into Mariupol, which we made very late in the night, uh, I saw over a thousand construction vehicles on the highway into the city. And that's not me being hyperbolic, it's true. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, construction teams are working diligently to rebuild not just the areas that have been destroyed by the war, but the areas that have been neglected for years and years and years by previous Ukrainian governments. In Mariupol itself, in the city, the work of these construction teams was all the more evident. There are new schools, beautiful parks, gyms, theaters, stores, hotels, and thousands of homes that have been given free to the victims of the conflict in Mariupol and for the surrounding areas. Residents express their gratitude for a government that is proactive and committed to responding to their needs. Mariupol residents also proudly shared with me the remarkable efficiency of these construction crews. I talked to one uh, little girl, 14 years old, at a park that I visited in Mariupol, and she told me that the construction teams that Russia sends in can build two blocks of infrastructure within one to two weeks. And I told her how amazing that was, because in America, it takes years to get a, a permit to build at least one road. But that was the truth. That's what was really going on, and it was incredible. The massive reconstruction effort essentially shows a nation that is actually committed to rebuilding and supporting its people, which is something that we have long abandoned in this country with our government. Next was my visit to Takmak. This was located about 15 kilometers from the front line, and uh, this was a very stark revelation for me. Contrary to the claims that Ukraine seeks to save the people of the Donbass from Russian invaders, the truth was far different. The truth was, that I witness a horrifying campaign of terrorism against innocent civilians living in the city of Takmak. Uh, the first site that we encountered in Takmak was a massive crater from a missile that had exploded just a few feet from a kindergarten playground just two months before I'd arrived. The windows of the kindergarten were completely shattered and there was glass all across the schoolyard. Uh, in addition to that, we also went on uh, and moved one street over, where we saw a civilian building that was hit by a U.S. Attackums missile. Uh, this was nothing new for the people there, because just the street over, we saw another building that had been hit by a U.S. supplied Attackums missile uh, two, two weeks after. And there were two civilians that were killed in this attack. Several others were injured. I had the opportunity to climb all the way up to the top of that second building that was hit by a U.S. missile, and uh, there was a few of, of us journalists that went up there. It was very dangerous because the entire roof of the building had collapsed. Uh, but what shocked me the most was in the building, I didn't see Russian military supplies. I didn't see guns. I didn't see Kalashnikovs or anything like that. I saw school supplies. I saw children's toys. 
and I saw everyday household items. When I descended from the top of the building, which was in, in tatters, uh, I actually had the opportunity to talk to the wife of one of the victims um, of this attack. Her, her uh, husband was actually killed in the attack. They tried to save him. His leg got blown off by this U.S. missile, and he bled out on the scene despite the best efforts of the people that were trying to revive him. She explained that Ukraine was routinely targeting their neighborhood with missile strikes, fully aware that they were bombing civilian areas rather than military targets. So for every time that Zelensky comes out and begs for more weapons, more missiles, more U.S. support, just know that it's being used to bomb innocent civilians in places like Tokmok and all across the Donbass. Also in Tokmok, we crossed the street one more time to a third building that had been bombed by a U.S. supplied missile two weeks before we arrived. So all of this happened in the span of two months. In a garden in front of the building that we visited, several elderly residents shared their experiences with us. Some of these residents had actually voted for Zelensky for president in 2019, but now expressed their profound disgust in his actions and the U.S.-backed Ukrainian terrorism affecting their homes. They now, vo they now voiced their total admiration for Russian President Vladimir Putin, and they had nothing but nice things to say. There was one old woman who barely spoke Russian. She was speaking Ukrainian, and she said uh, one thing in Russian. She said, Ya uh President Putin, which means I love uh, President Putin. Uh, it was very interesting to hear from the actual voices of the people of the Donbass because everyone in the mainstream media, doesn't matter if it's on the left or the right, has failed to actually report on what the people there are saying. Lastly, and probably most shockingly, was my visit to the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant. Uh, this power plant has been in the news quite a bit recently. It's the largest nuclear power plant in all of Europe. It has six reactors, none of which are operational at the moment. Uh, but what I saw there highlighted the grave risk posed by Ukraine's military actions above everything else. Despite the plant being just a few kilometers away from the front line, we were very close to the front line. Uh, thousands of heroic workers continue their duties at the plant each and every day. 95% of these workers worked at the plant when it was under Ukrainian control. However, several points of critical infrastructure at the plant have recently been compromised by Ukrainian drone attacks and shelling. Uh, in fact, the director of the plant gave me this right here. This is a fragment from one of the drone attacks on the plant that occurred just feet away from uh, where the reactors lie in the ground. So, you know, he said it was my taxpayer dollars that did this, so I got to keep the fragment. I was very appreciative. One other very alarming sight that I witnessed at the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant was a missile from the United States, which was lodged halfway in the ground, just 100 feet away from the plant's nuclear storage facility. This reckless attack could have led to a catastrophic nuclear disaster, endangering millions of lives. Such actions are far from the moral code of conduct that any real military, any just military, should uphold. In conclusion, my observations from the Donbass reveal a reality that is starkly different from the narratives presented by Western mainstream media and politicians. The truth I've witnessed shows that Ukraine is not on the path to victory, but rather escalating a conflict uh, where there is no need to do so. The horrifying acts of terrorism carried out against civilians in Tokmak and the reckless jeopardization of nuclear safety at the Zaporozhia power plant illustrate a deliberate strategy of violence and escalation rather than a genuine pursuit of peace. The people of the Donbass, who have endured immense suffering, are now experiencing a measure of hope and rebuilding under Russian efforts, a hope that stands in stark contrast to the false portrayals of Russian aggression and Ukrainian victimhood. I think today, uh, more so than ever before, we need to heed the words of the now free Julian Assange, who once said, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by the truth. Uh, it is imperative that we confront these falsehoods and work towards de-escalating the conflict and in fact, for all the journalists in attendance here today, I encourage you to visit the Donbass yourself from the side that's been liberated. Uh, CNN has indicated that they want to come out with me on my next visit to the Donbass, so we'll see if they stick to their word. But if any of you want to come out, we can talk. 
Most importantly, we must commit ourselves to reporting the truth, shining a light on the innocent civilians caught in the crossfire, and seeking a path to genuine peace. Only through truth and transparency can we hope to resolve this conflict and prevent the devastating possibility of a global catastrophe. Thank you. Jackson, thank you for your speech. Thank you, gentlemen. Diese Extremisten. Kriegstreiber. Verbrecher. Ist ein Diktator. Der Schurken auf Feinde der Menschenrechte.